cool. So, so far we've heard from Hannah about how really getting stuck into building a marketing team, from Chris from building a marketing team. But what I want to talk about is data. This talk, let me get it started up, is started life um, at CXL Live. So earlier this year, I gave a talk on customer data operations, how you set up customer data to work within your business. But all this, all this good stuff, how do you use it? And that's where the, the, this talk comes from. Um, so just to get started, uh, I'm big into personalization. I'm big into understanding my audience. Who here would say they're mostly CRO? Mostly CRO? OK, a few. Mostly SEO? OK, a few. Content? Something else? OK, cool. So everyone else has started so far with their sort of backstory and how they got into the world. My marketing world started like this. Do you remember your first website, like the really bad first website you made? <laughs> so this is my AdSense thing. This is how I got into it, figuring out how to like, do some basic keyword research, make something rank, and then collect dollars at the end. I remember watching early Whiteboard Fridays from Moz, SEO Moz, um, who told you how like, SEO should be done, right? But what I actually found work, this is 10 years ago, is you just post that content somewhere else, link back, and collect AdSense dollars. So this early, early sort of uh, SEO and early growth sort of gave me some confidence, and I ended up pitching a agency called Distilled, based in London, on doing some summer internship work there. And there I learned a bit how SEO actually works. It's more than just easy articles. And over successive summers, I started doing some work with them and their consulting, training, and conferences. And conferences. It's through Distilled I learned to love conferences. Also, like a few different pieces there. The highlight of my SEO filth being a uh, named link from Seth Godin's blog. Um, but it's through Distilled I learned to love conferences. I love the coming together of people, ideas, and drinks. And often, this would all, I'd get carried away and bring this all together all at once, drunk pitching other attendees' ideas. My most successful of which was drunk pitching Rand, a jobs board for his new inbound.org community, um, which he co-founded with Dharmesh at HubSpot. And for some reason, they said, yes, Ed, here's 500 bucks a month for your time. Here's $12,000 to last indefinitely. Go fly. Meanwhile, they were going to go and grow Moz, venture-backed, HubSpot venture-backed, and I worked on this trip whilst at university. And I think my biggest success is I didn't kill it. Uh, and it began to grow, began to figure out the community thing, and it became clear this was more than everyone's side project. Either Moz or HubSpot uh, should give this full backing, full investment. And that wound up with HubSpot acquiring Inbound.org about 12 months before they went public. Now, this is a very interesting time to be sort of C of you inside a company like this. They were scaling international. They were scaling their new freemium sales team, uh, sales products, uh, with a new growth team led by Brian Balfour. They were probably my favorite uh, people inside HubSpot. And then the, uh, what did Chris say? Like the business, uh, business process blockers, the lawyers team, uh, seeing how that scales up before going public. So very, very insightful time. But it's with the back here of HubSpot that we can grow our own team and grow the community to about 150,000 members. Uh, we grew a team from Bucharest to Seattle, all kinds of designers, developers, community managers. And with the visibility and acquisition of HubSpot, acquisition was no longer a problem. The focus for me moved on to engagement and retention. And this was a bit of a problem. Because as I got to know more people in the industry personally, through conferences, through the community, you could start to call in favors, do this AMA pep, or can you join us for this question, or help us out with this campaign. But this doesn't scale. This isn't going to generate the platform-wide behavioral change we need it to grow. And meanwhile, like all the hacks which could drive massive reach and massive engagement, every marketer would hate. We talked about the uh, Chrome notifications earlier, Twitter bots, all that kind of stuff. If you remember, does anyone remember page fights? Pa right. So. This was the age where people were being outed. I, people like uh, Pep and Ollie would go and say, you know, this is a terrible tactic, this is a terrible brand. Would I just go and torture the inbound or community by doing this kind of stuff? So this gave me a bit of a dilemma. On the one hand, I could just call in favors and get nowhere. On the other hand, I could go and scale this thing and torture it everywhere. I call this the frontier of failure. There was no good choices here. So I was forced to push outwards, forced to find something new, and forced to look into personalization at scale. And the secret to this was data and data integration. Uh, and this is what I want to spend some time talking about. Um, and ultimately, this wound up with me joining Hull. Uh, now, being based in London and Hull in Paris and Atlanta, this had the perks of a little bit of travel, because um, the French were well known for their food, a bit of steak frites, but snails, not so much. Um, now, what's interesting about customer data 
is it sits across the entire organization. Customer data informs marketing, sales, CS, product, design, development, finance, whatever. But our job in, inside Hull was really figuring out who this person was. And this was a pretty painful path. Coming in from inbound or coming in from having this success with personalization, it's definitely for marketers, right? This is something we own, we push forward. Turns out, not so much. Whilst you might have the ideas, whilst you might push those ideas forward, this generated a ton of support tickets. These weren't people using Hull every day, doing customer data management every day. Maybe technical marketers, maybe people who understood design, uh, sorry, data a little more. But again, we looped around that and eventually settled on data engineers. We moved, if you like, from Hannah's talk, which is talking about positioning, from people who are logging in every now and then with sort of a moderate MPS to people spending four to five hours a day on the platform, an MPS over 80, and we 10x our spend. This was not easy. Now, if there's a common theme to all this crazy story and why I share this crazy story, it's data and how it was used and how it wasn't used when it went right and when it went wrong. And that's what we want to talk about today. See, it makes me believe there are two types of people in the world. Those people who live and breathe data, the kind of people who are here, the kind of people who believe this is the future, and those who don't. But even the people who are here, it's how do you turn that data into action? Like, your data is like a library. Everyone can collect that. Everyone can have a big collection of books. Most of us can go and read those books. Like, we can get analysts, we can get BI, we can do all that analytic stuff. But you haven't actually done anything yet. How do you act on your data? So through working at Hull, through that background, through that story, I think I've spotted a pattern. And it's not better analytics. It's not better reporting. It's not all the things everyone else talks about when they talk about data. And it starts with collecting data. Or, like, it's, it's very easy. There's thousands of different tools to help, plenty of plug-and-play pieces. The, uh, the easy example is Google Analytics, right? I remember first seeing Google Analytics, the, the funnel report, the geography report, the best piece, the most addictive piece maybe to look up is real-time thing. You guys are already watching that. You're not watching me. This, this piece is really addictive, right? But so what? Just because there's people on your website, just because there's people taking action, what's the next part of that journey? This is just a tiny snippet, people dropping on, dropping off. So our inbound to org and maybe other places, we had all our website analytics. We had our email newsletter. These are just tiny, tiny bits of the customer journey. We zoom out. Where's the rest of it? At inbound.org, like, what were our members doing? At Hull, how were people using the product? And this is a real problem. So this, the, the story starts with access to the right data. Where is your customer journey? It's not in that turnkey plug and play tool. It's not even an email. You might have a CRM. Hopefully, your salespeople get, keep that up to date. So the one of the big aha moments for me early on in my career is understanding where a lot of this data was. For inbound.org, we had a back end. This is how our software works. And actually, the first time I had access to that back end, we could start to do some interesting things. At last, this was like having water. This was like having your first breath of air. By using SQL, we could start to understand our members. You can start to understand your customers inside that little database. In a morning of doing really basic tutorials, Chris talked about this earlier, like that hour and a half you're going to set aside every Tuesday, you can start to do dumb things like this. Like dumb things, really simple things, but start to really understand those customers because you have access to that data, those places which aren't just plug and play. So in my case, I want to understand more about our best users. For instance, where were they in the world? And a simple query like this, which you could learn in less than half an hour, started to give that level of understanding. And with that access to all that behavior data, we could start to really understand these people, which cohorts mattered, which skills in the community, which countries seemed to give the best contributors. If you were to guess what the top two countries by the proportion of contributors they might be, who would come to mind? Any suggestions? Would you say Estonia? Would you say... We went through all the countries earlier. You guys not? <laughs> so the clue is in the picture. This is not Romania. Correct. This is not the mother of all Airbnbs. This is the Palace of the Parliament in Bucharest, Romania. So Romania and Israel, uh, both very technical, both uh, very good English, and both like breeding grounds for incredible marketers. So how do you apply this to you? Like, where is your customer journey captured? What are the data sources that make up that perfect God view of your customer? And it's not in that first, the first thing you can grab. 
It's not always in Google Analytics. It's not always in that email tool. Where are you going to have to go just that little bit further to go and get that complete view? Second, what does your, tool, uh, your team need to access this data? Is it another tool? Is it skills like SQL? Are there different kinds of inputs, like your sales reps filling in a CRM? Or any kind of logins that you're going to have to pay for? And third, do they know they can access that data today? Like, we had all that SQL data just sitting there, and I didn't know about it. So three questions to get started. But just because we have access to data did not mean we could drive growth. Just because I knew about our Romanian members, just because I knew about our Israeli members, like, so what? I could then just spinning around doing all kinds of different analysis. Remember, I was very young at this time. Where do you focus? And this is where I like to talk about models. Can you, use, can you build data from your models? Can you align all your growth efforts in one direction? And rather than spinning around doing different kinds of analysis and making all these dumb decisions, dumb questions, focus your energies. So at, economic, uh, at university, I studied economics. And economists would derive and manipulate equations in order to understand theory and extend their knowledge. So this equation, this slide I nicked from a, a university lecture slide I had, this explains how economies grow. It's some function of savings rate, capital, pro population growth, et cetera. So what? Can you do this in your business with your product and so on? So at Inbound.org, this is exactly what we did. We tried to model the relationships between the pieces of the puzzle here. So at Inbound, you could submit a link and people could comment on it, or you could submit a discussion and people comment on it. We wanted to understand the relationship between that and weekly contributors, and understand the relationship between weekly contributors and people just logging in and being active on the platform. So how do we do this? Well, there are many analytical techniques. There are many people here who are going to do that far better than me. But doing simple linear regression, a line of best fit between two variables, this is something really easy to do in a spreadsheet tool, something really easy to share graphically so you can get your whole team can understand it. The statistics we can get into, but what really matters, the skill, it's picking what goes on the axis. So in our case, we're looking at weekly active users versus unique weekly contributors. And you can see there's a relationship visually. There's a strong R squared. Like this, this starts to make sense. So what things can you pick? Are there different types of people that you can analyze? Are there different actions that you, uh, people are taking? Are there different objects? In our case, articles, discussions. You might have products. You might have features used, et cetera. The skill is picking the things you want to model and start pulling that together. And from this model, we had three hypotheses for growth. And this enabled us to focus our energies and focus our efforts. One, it appeared like contributors seemed to drive weekly active users. So if we increase one, we'd probably increase the other. Second, discussions appeared to have a lot more power than articles on increasing contributors. And finally, it appeared from other analysis from this model that existing contributors were easier to win back than getting people to contribute for the first time. What this meant? is that first thing we tried to build the community around, just submitting and sharing links, was not going to drive growth. Discussions had to be the focus. The conversation is the content. The comment is the conversion. And this started to uh, pivot around uh, all, all our growth and all our strategy. So the questions to ask yourselves on using data for models. Like what are the types of people, the cohorts, the different flavors of your members, users, leads, customers that you can compare? What are the actions that they take? And what are the objects within your, within your company that you can compare? From there, from that analysis, can you create a simple growth model? And within that, can you identify where the biggest levers are and focus your attention there? But so what? Like, we had this growth, growth model. We had these three hypotheses. I was just still sat in London in an office. I need to get my team on board. They needed a destination. Chris talked about this earlier. How do you set goals? How do you align teams? How do you motivate teams to go in one direction? And anyone who's worked in any kind of company has struggled with this. Anyone who's worked in any kind of company with individuals, teams, just moving in different directions, pouring a stupid amount of energy into clashing together or diff pulling in different directions. There are four things which I found which helped get this miracle, this miracle of alignment. The first one uh, has already been talked about, the North Star metric. What is that one metric that you can align everyone behind? Uh, so Sean Ellis came and gave a talk last year at CXL all about how to build this growth culture, all how to build uh, around this North Star metric. But this on its own doesn't mean much. What you really got to do is assign the objective as build the team behind that. So at Inbound, we cared about weekly active users. But how are we going to get there? Well, from our growth model, which we can derive now from the North Star metric, we can start to assign an objective on the community team. 
So we wanted 1,500 weekly contributors, a lot more than we had previously. And how we were going to get there? Well, we thought we wanted to reactivate existing contributors, and it appeared like the best way was discussion. It appeared like the best way for that was Q&A. So you can see how we can build these objectives uh, behind the North Star metric. Those of you who are familiar with OKRs, this is a similar kind of uh, process. From there, you can start to build your org structure around that growth model. I noticed this at HubSpot as they were scaling their marketing team fast. You'd have a channel metric like MQLs divide down by different, sorry, you have like an overall North Star metric like uh, MQLs, and that would divide down by something like a channel, SEO, inbound, whatever, or by region. Germany started as one person, that team ballooned. Uh, and, and these days, more cross-functional teams. And then finally, waterfall charts. If you can plot actual versus target performance cumulatively over time, you get quite an amazing chart like this. This, is, this uh, shows that it, if I go over here, this shows a, a real goal line that, we were, that we we're trying to get to the 1500. This shows our actual performance. This difference made us feel like the bee's knees. This difference of getting ahead, the experiments, the, the success we saw there felt awesome. But you see how we sort of get complacent. You see how we dropped off. You see how this suddenly felt very unmotivating. If we didn't track this, if we didn't report this like this, uh, we wouldn't have felt that same, that same feeling. So the, water, the, the waterfall chart is powerful because it gives everything you need uh, in one simple view. And then what you can do is combine all these four things all at once. From your North Star, you can assign individual objectives. You can build that org chart and then assign waterfall charts for every single one of these KPIs. This is incredibly powerful, just drawing that together, alignment, drawing together that structure. So the question is to ask yourselves, what is your North Star metric? This might not be something we as marketers control, but it's a discussion we can drive. Is this relevant and long-term to your entire team? Second, for each team in person, do they have an objective which drives towards this? Does, does it line up with your growth model? Does it line up with their OKRs? Does this line up with your org structure? And third, how are you reporting that progress towards the objective? Can you use something like waterfall charts? But goals on their own do not drive growth. Like, so what? Now we, we wanted to get to 1,500. It, it, it doesn't mean anything. What we really need to do is that to take action, to inform what we're working on day to day. Now, up until this point, this hasn't been really threatening to people who aren't data driven. Remember, two types of people in the world. People who go by gut decision, or this is how we've always done it. At CXL Life this year, my favorite quote was from Matt Roach at Sanoma. There's no way to train people who have a bad attitude. It's just recruitment, redundancy, and resignations. Brutal. But he's right. There are people, when you try to be data-driven, when you really try to use data for action, who are going to resist. And actually, at some point, they might need to move out of the organization. So remember this. We have the North Star metric, the objectives you want to set, and a strategy which you want to get there. So how do we actually do it? Well, we wanted to focus on Q&A. Turns out most people in the, most people in the community um, were posting questions anyway. The challenge was then getting answers for it. So we'd find an, find an interesting question, tidy it up, and get it ready to share with the team. We then, inside HubSpot, our marketing automation tool that so happened to run it, own us, we'd create a segment of those ideal users. More than 500 people based by time zone, based on the skill sets they had, uh, they had told us in their profiles, based on their recent activity. We then send a personal email inviting contributions from those people. A plain text email, Gmail style, the kind of thing where I'd be caught, looked like I was calling it a favor one-to-one. -one. But we'd be able to send this to a very large audience. Within about an hour, we'd have about uh, 10 people contributing. And at that, this point, the thread took a life of its own. At this point, those threads were the worthwhile sharing with the wider community. This cycle, which we could do all day, every day, drove growth within discussions. So behind the scenes, what we did is unified that data. We unified uh, that complete uh, member profile from our SQL database into HubSpot, so we knew exactly that full context in every member. We can then create a library of segments any community manager could use. And whenever we find a question, uh, we'd have a, that, those segments ready to use right away. At Hull, we had a client doing a very similar process with lead nurturing. They unified and built that complete profile with Clearbit and HubSpot data. They'd then try and match that up with a perfect content for those clients and created really niche webinars for each of those. They'd email just the people who fit those webinars and mark all the attendees and marketing qualified leads. This worked really, really well. Those, the niche topics, the niche pain points, uh, 
yeah, really, really hit a resonate. But more, uh, more importantly for sales is they'd have these highly educated, highly informed leads come in and a sales conversation start at every time. AppQs, another client we worked with uh, using product data, product usage data on their free trials with a very similar process, this time with Slack notifications. So questions to ask yourselves on using data for process. What are the regular processes that are part of your growth? How, do, how does the data inform what you work on, what your team is working on? In our case, product usage data, member data, et cetera. And how do you turn that into a repeatable playbook? The process does not drive growth, like growth, growth, growth with a capital G. Think of the fastest growing companies you know. They don't have humans involved in every single decision, every single process. And really, this is where inbound all failed. I need a drink at this point. The problem with our growth process there is it stuck me and every community manager in the middle of it. The problem then is when I left and other people left, that process wasn't maintained. The platform couldn't keep up. The platform didn't have a natural uh, means for reactivating people. And what wound up is the community began to die off. Um, and I don't know if any of you followed, but HubSpot uh, shut it down earlier this year. If you want to get to outsized growth and outsized results, you need to break away from being part of that chain. And really, this is where those pirate analogies end. This is really where Jack Sparrow goes off. This is really where a ship like this is no longer relevant, where it's manual, where it's led by you know, sea shanties, and this is how we've always done it. You need to think something more like this. This is a Type 45 destroyer in service of the Royal Navy. It's the most powerful anti-air warship in the world. It can identify up to 3,000 objects the size of a baseball, traveling at Mark III, prioritize them by risk level, and shoot them all down until it's out of ammo. This is a totally outsized amount of firepower for a ship of its size and manpower. Why? What's different? The fact is, all the decisions and how it engages are decided up front. It runs on a system of rules. Yes, there's automation. Yes, there's process. But that follows from the system of rules. The fundamental mindset, and if there's one thing I want to teach you, is that you need to think about building rules and building systems like this. So what do I mean by that? This is the kind of systems which we, we see in growth, but what do I mean by that? How do you apply this kind of logic to your company? Well, let's start with a rule we all have, pricing. For every new customer, you don't come up with a new pricing model, but your pricing determines the value of every single customer. Your pricing is actually an incredibly valuable growth lever. Patrick Campbell at Price Intelligently says it's four times more effective than acquisition, twice as effective as working retention. We doubled our quota, we doubled our growth at Hull this month just by focusing on pricing alone. This is one example. Next example, sales compensation. At HubSpot, in the early days, they found a large cause of churn because their, uh, their sales guys were signing up customers who were poor fit. So rather than paying just on the new subscriptions, they started to pay them based on the retained dollars. Suddenly, over the course of a couple of months, that uh, high cause of churn flew away. And then, as they were trying to grow again, they were trying to increase the number of people on annual contracts, they started to pay annual, uh, annual contracts paid up front for the sales rep. They tripled their uh, lifetime value and able to move into hypergrowth. But what about something we control? Like We don't tend to control sales compensation. We don't tend to control pricing alone. But we do control things like content. So I'm a big fan of Booking.com. Uh, for all sorts of like marketing ideas and experiment ideas. Um, but one thing in particular I think they do well is scaling content. So like everyone in travel, they need to be able to compete across millions of hotel pages, millions of different locations. Uh, but without making really crap content, like we've all seen that terrible SEO content. Remember like my first website, this is not good stuff, this is not a good, good experience. So how do you do something like this? You may not be able to see it at the back, but they highlight a bunch of hotel features like anyone else. But then they've got things like location and proximity. This hotel is located five minutes drive from four golf courses. Interesting. Maybe there's some, like, whatever process going on there. I know there's some new user reviews things, like they're highlighting things users are picking up on. What about the searcher context? Like they're saying, this, this is uh, good for solo travelers. You speak my language. How do you do this? So this is what I started to play around with. And it's called content modeling. If you take something like a blog post, a blog post has a title, a body, and an author. But an author might have multiple blog posts. You want to reference that same bio, that same face, that same description across multiple places, right? So can you Frankenstack this all together into, say, a landing page? Can you do things like this? Use and reuse different elements, like you would an author bio, to build landing pages really quickly. 
can you template together landing pages like you would with Lego? So you can do this with tools like Webflow and Instapage, but if you want to write complete control, you can do something like this. Break it down into design. So we worked with our designer to come up with a, a set of common templates, a set of common elements. Here's a, like a header, here's an image with whatever list. This is stuff which is set, in, set up front. This is the rules which you set. Next, uh, development. How do you template all those rules, template that design? So we used a static site generator, uh, GitHub, and then Netlify to build this and manage different versioning. Again, rules set up front. Then content. So we use a headless CMS called Contentful. We can create a content model for every landing page. We can then reference, say this is an integrations page, we're going to reference all these different blocks here. And then we can use this system to scale and build landing pages really, really quickly. This system, rather than getting stuck in point and click, rather than getting stuck being part of that process, we can break out of that. And more importantly, we can start to create different rules. Say we want to go and do some larger descriptions, we can send that to scripted.com with a job. Send that API call back into Contentful, start to rebuild those pages. Maybe use MonkeyLearn for some natural language processing, do some of the things with uh, the reviews. Maybe you want to retarget companies coming to our, uh, coming to our website with clear bit reveal data, people on G2 crowd, like going crazy. Maybe even Alexa. Alexa, build me a conference page for Elite Camp, make it red. All the rules are set up front. So what do we do with this? Well, we use this to scale feature pages, product marketing pages. Uh, in this case, an integrations page. And this is really good for producing sales content very quickly, consistent sales content very quickly. It's good for scalable SEO. Like We doubled our admittedly meager organic search. But more importantly, I could get 43 unique landing pages out in one week, down to about three minutes per page. And that will, con that will continue. So the other thing, nice thing I like about Booking.com is the personalization. We, you can imagine now how we built the, uh, the templating is built. What about the customer data? So they say where to go next there. I like this, asking me about my last hotel visit, calling me a genius. Brilliant. If there's one good thing from GDPR, is it's highlighted exactly how much customer data we have. This is probably the only example of a privacy policy which I think is any good, and I think is clear, and I think is a positive experience. Uh, from a company called Juro, which helped manual uh, manage legal contracts. Um, you can check out the link at the end. But what, again, you can use customer data to drive these kinds of rules. And really quickly, there are three types of rules which to look at. Firstly, segments, who you want to talk to, templates, what you want to say, and the workflows, when and where to say it. So I want to work through each one of those. Firstly, segments. So we talked earlier, Hannah talked about the lead qualification piece. Previously, maybe they just took anything with the demo request coming in, and that was a qualified lead. Well, we had a client with exactly this problem. They had a 50% drop-off in demo request response rate. Why? Because the sales had no context. They would be calling people in countries they didn't serve with integration, with tools they didn't integrate with. So by using data enrichment from things like Clearbit and Datanize, they could start to answer some of those questions up front and only filter through the leads which were a good fit. But then what about intent and engagement? Can you look at things like product usage and start to use that to inform what this qualified lead looks like? and maybe throw in some AI. One of our sister companies called Mad Kudu focuses only on this. How do you send the best qualified leads through? Get the segments to do all the work there. Next, templates. So we talked about this a bit with the content modeling piece, but whether it's web, email, or chat, get the templates to do all the work. Uh, at HubSpot, we were so limited. Um, I like to use Liquid, which is something Shopify produced. It's in inside a lot of tools, like Custom.io. You can start to use some very advanced personalization, far beyond first name. That's not personalization. I'm talking, you're a marketer, you're a really good fit company, so we want to talk to you right now, and your psychographic profile is dominant, so we're going to talk to you in this way. This is the kind of stuff which is possible, and people are executing it day to day. Similarly, internationalization. This is another thing where templating can do all the work. One other thing you can do with templates is control the internal conversation. So we had the discussion earlier about how you uh, queue in and help your sales reps. How can you use data and compute that into something which is going to give your sales reps all the cues and conversation starters they care about? Maybe Hannah from Shopify gives us a demo request. What am I going to say as a sales rep? Or maybe it's something about your data warehousing. Maybe the fact you're moving on to Salesforce. Maybe the fact you've got all these different technologies and you've been reading this for X months. That your sales rep is now ready to go. And finally, workflows. I promise the last one. <laughs> workflows. Hands up who uses Zapier or any kind of marketing automation tool or anything like that. I'm surprised. You guys are very shy or, okay. So if this, then that. Like, add a new uh, Intercom user if you get a MailChimp subscriber. That kind of thing. Now, rolling back to inbound.org, I was able to build some of this stuff inside HubSpot. 
was working on a profile completion campaign with this kind of logic. If new user, is it a profile complete? If so, pick, pick one of these drip pieces. But remember the level of personalization I was doing previously with the Q&A. So I wanted to make this a little, more, uh, a little more personal. Like, had they connected to Twitter? This was something which was very important to us in terms of learning, uh, learning data on our members. But this really wasn't enough. What I really wanted to do was something like this. All these different fields, all these different things, which I would personalize if I was there in person. Why couldn't I do this with my data? And the trouble is, you can imagine how branched and how crazy this, these workflows would get. So this was a complete epic fail. Uh, within an hour, this thing was shut down inside of a HubSpot portal. We had HubSpot engineering uh, looking at my thing and saying, whoa. Uh, we sent about 50,000 emails that day. Some people got like 20 emails each, and it was just a complete mess. Don't manage complexity with your workflows, is the lesson from that. Uh, get it to handle complexity in your segments, handle complexity in your templates. And that was just one campaign. That was just one onboarding campaign. This is an overview of the data flows inside one of our cus uh, customers, a pre presentation they gave internally. There's a lot of complexity in this. So you need a way beyond just workflows to manage this complexity when you're trying to scale. And there's three rules for that. One, you want to unify your data all in one place, a complete God view of everything about your customers and everything they've ever done. You need to be able to transform data. You need to be able to compute the attributes, the events, the segments, all in one place. And you're able to sync that bi-directionally with all your other tools. Then you can let the templating do the work. Just to finish, I want to share how you can do this kind of custom data orchestration at the end. Um, and we see teams, we work mostly with B2B SaaS, uh, work up the funnel, if you like. So it starts by aligning teams. Marketing and their source of truth, their, uh, their data platform like HubSpot is a marketing automation tool, and sales in their separate kingdom, in their CRM, these teams not talking to each other, these teams not sharing a common set of data. So it starts by coming up with a common definition of a qualified lead, having that written down, having that defined in data, also then syncing the talking points so these people aren't left without any context, otherwise they'll lean on their own biases, and giving the data of a lead assignment too. How do you get that data to flow to your sales guys? And then to give marketing the data they want, some follow-up SLA, please follow up with these leads within the next two hours. Share the sales activity so we can track that and engage again based on that. And finally, feedback and attribution to revise this model and improve it. Next, once you've got that model working, you can move up the funnel to lead engagement. Um, a lot of our customers start trying to do omni-channel marketing. So how would you take the same message and use it across multiple channels all at once? Say, you don't want to burn out email. You don't want people to unsubscribe. But where else do you go? Say something like ads, and then tracking that back. But the problem with something like that is you don't know in all your systems if they've reacted, if they've clicked, if they've done X, Y, or Z, which is why for everything you do, every channel you're engaged in, you need to track this back into your unified lead profile, universal lead tracking, and use every single one of those events, every single one of those reactions to update those segments globally and kick it back out to all your different tools. And then finally, this is more B2B one, is managing that intent data. How do you talk to people before they've even signed up, before they've even given your email? Well, you can identify companies who are interested in, uh, in your services based on things like IP. So maybe someone's on G2 Crowd looking at things in your category. Maybe people are visiting your website. Maybe people are clicking links on social. Well, you can use that IP address to identify the companies there. Maybe they're like a competitor, a partner, whatever, but maybe they're actually quite a qualified account. Can you run prospecting on them? Can you sync those prospects to all the different channels? Here's a real example. Someone's visiting our website. They're a feature features page. They're looking at our SQL integrations page. Turns out they're Typeform. Typeform would be a great fit company for us. Great. So how do we create a segment of companies like Typeform who have all the kind of properties which we care about, who aren't existing customers, prospects, partners, whatever? Can we sync that segment of companies like Typeform to a prospecting tool to prospect for the roles which we care about most? Then can we send those prospects to all the different channels we care about, whether that's email, ads, sales, whatever, and use templating and workflows to send those hyper-personalized messages there. So just to wrap this up, that's the kind of rules-based growth which we see within our clients. We see, in, in using that exact reveal loop, intent data-driven uh, growth, we're seeing a return on ad spend over 7.5, i.e. $1 in, $7.5 out. Another getting about 10,000 a day net new revenue with our SDR team off the back of this intent data. Both are growth teams of one. Both are driving outsized results with rules-based growth. They're not making themselves part of the process. They're making themselves define the rules day to day. 
So questions to ask on that. Where are your decision-making moments in your growth process? How can you create rules around them? Don't involve yourself. Abstract yourself. Don't do what I did with inbound. What's the ideal data flow for each decision? Where's the data coming from? What decisions need to be involved there? Where do you need to sync it? And finally, of all your leading customer data, how can you unify, transform, and sync all that in one place? So just to wrap up, this will be the last piece. This is the kind of an overview of what we talked about today. Without access to data, without access to the customer journey, you fly blind. Without a model to focus your decisions and growth process, you start to make dumb decisions. Without goals, without that system of management by metrics, you have misaligned teams, everything Chris was talking about. Without process, you just have chaos. There's no, uh, there's no rhyme or reason. But the key thing, and the key thing how to move to true outsized results, is investing in rules and investing in data-driven growth. So just the, the final example, you get access uh, with the demand gen team we, uh, we work with. So we get access through a custom data platform. That's how they got that complete view. A lot of data coming from Salesforce, SQL, Clearbit, et cetera. The, the model was based on their funnel. The two funnels based on a freemium upsell and a sales upsell. Uh, the goals were based around MQLs. The, the process was built around optimizing uh, rules, and the rules were all around automating uh, that lead nurturing and uh, personalization. So there's a ton of resources, but if you go to whole.io slash get such a lead camp, you can dig into some of this a little more. And that's me, Tevi Six. <laughs>